Sometimes we just need one person to believe in us before we can believe in ourselves. But what happens when you actually have several people believe in you? How does that lift you up in your career, not just your professional life, but your personal life as well? In this really great conversation with Vernon Wright, he shares like an incredible journey sharing his pathway and how he saw where his career was going and how he was mentored to do something totally different. I think it's really powerful. It reminds us how important it is to get our voice out there, to share our talents and gifts with the world, not only as educators, but ensure that we do that for our students as well. I really love the conversation with Vernon. He tells a really compelling story. I hope you enjoy it. everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I've had the pleasure to hang out, chill, talk with Vernon Wright and uh, just record some stuff, have some conversation uh, before the podcast. And I'll tell you, this guy is absolutely amazing. I, I am so excited to talk education and about 10 million other things because I have no idea. This guy has so many interests. There's so many different areas that you know he shares on social media. Um, he shares through, um, you know, through just as inspirational talks, we just recorded, finished a podcast and like, I felt like Rocky at the end of it. I was just like <laughs> ready to run upstairs. So he's absolutely incredible. And I just want to share a little personal story, uh, about Vernon. I actually, uh, I've been, and I, if you, if you follow me at all, if you see any of my stuff, I've been really working my butt off, um, not just in the gym, but with how I've been eating. And, uh, it's not been easy. It's, you know, it's tough. I, I feel like I'm in the groove. Some days are harder than others, but I've been pretty disciplined and it, I've been trying and I'm, I share little parts of my journey here and there, but I don't post about it every day. I post more to kind of like keep track of my progress. And, uh, Vernon wrote a post yesterday and he gave me a shout out. And that's not why I asked him on the podcast, but it was like, I asked him way long ago, <laughs> but he said something and, uh, it really meant a lot to me, Vernon, that you did that, uh, acknowledging the work that I've been doing. It has nothing to do with education, but it really reminded me. And it wasn't just that you acknowledged me. Uh, I know you do. And you didn't just do me. It was someone else too. But it was like, it wasn't just like you shouted out 84 people. There was like some real authenticity, real noticing. And it reminded me how important it is to have people who cheer you on in this world, whether you've just know them on social media um, and you've never, cause we've never met personally. I don't think we've only had conversations. I've been on your podcast and I'm glad to have you on mine today. And so just kind of having those cheerleaders. And I, I feel this is one of the things I love about connecting with you is I guarantee you hundreds of other people could share a very similar story about you. And, and I, I just think that, having those cheerleaders that pump you up, you know, appreciate the work that you've done makes the world a better place. I, you made my world way better yesterday. Uh, Cause okay. it, it was, uh, you know, going through this is, is tough and a struggle and you just kind of pump me up just being noticed. So Vernon, thanks for doing that. And a lot of people, um, you know, might be hearing you for the first time. You've done a ton of it in education. Can you just tell, talk people through your career? Like how did you get to doing what you're doing today? Yeah, real short story, a uh, bachelor's degree in uh, business administration with a specialization in economics and finance, master's degree in leadership. So when I got out of uh, undergrad, I thought that, you know, hey, I want to go into corporate America and I want to operate in this world of economics and finance. So I did that, worked for a major brokerage firm. If I told you the name of the brokerage firm, some of you would probably say, I either have a brokerage account there or I have mutual funds there or a whole bunch of stuff there right? Uh, maybe some annuities there as well. But I uh, did that for a while. And I came to a point where to go to the next level, what they had said to me, my um, manager at the time, and even my colleagues that I was working with was, hey, look, man, you're going to have to go ahead and get an MBA. Because I was really the only person in my group at that time that had not uh, gone back to school and uh, had worked on and received an MBA. And so I really kind of came to what one of my principals later on that I would meet uh, often used to say, I came to a decision point in my life and I was kind of like, okay, so do I really want to do this MBA thing? And um, I really felt this calling in my heart to go in a different direction. I, you know, was a businessman and have been a businessman ever since I went through undergrad. That's why my undergrad 
uh, was in economics and finance, but a little fun tip that people may not know. Uh, there was always an education part of me because when I started my freshman year, I was on the fence between business and being a teacher. And I started out as a chemistry major because I was either thinking about being a chemistry teacher or a math teacher. And then that first semester as a freshman, I had a business class with a professor and uh, his name is Lewis Raymond McLean. He has passed but a phenomenal man, chartered financial analyst, a CFA, if any of you uh, know what uh, that is and what that entails, very rigorous designation professionally. And he changed my life. And then I jumped back over into business. And so really, when I got to this point of this whole MBA thing and whether I wanted to do it or not, I really had to ask myself about the ROI. And those of you that are in business or finance, you know, that ROI is return on investment. And I really asked myself, you know, hey, if I did this, would I really get the return on investment? And one of the things I thought about was, hey, like I'm working with these guys that all have MBAs. So if I get an MBA, is that really going to propel me to a position beyond what I'm working in now? Because I'm already working around guys that have MBAs. So I decided to go ahead and switch and get into this education thing because I had always wanted to do training that like was always a part of me. So got into training or got into education in this very, very small town. You probably have never heard of it. A small town called Dallas, Texas. It's a little facetious there. And at the time, Dallas was a huge, huge district, which it still is. But at the time, Dallas had about 150,000 students and about 210 schools or so. And started out as a high school teacher. And this high school I taught at. I uh, could take you to it today. It is like a small city. And um, that high school at the time had about 2,500 students. And my plan at the time was, you know, hey, look, I'm going to do this education thing, um, kind of do that. But, you know, I was still kind of working before we called them side hustles. I was still kind of working some side hustle stuff. Mm -hmm. I was still kind of working some business because, again, remember, a part of me has, has, was always business and has always been business and will always be business, Right. Right. So it's always been a part of me. So my plan originally was just to down here in Texas, you teach for about 20, 25 years, and then you get a pension, right? So I was doing that. I got about three years into this thing and about two to three years into it. And I remember um, going to my mailbox one day. So, you know, the teacher's mailboxes, it was just literally like a wall, George. Right. So this campus, big campus, 25, 2,600 students, we had about 130 teachers on staff. So you just see a wall of mailboxes when you go to check here. So I went to go check mine. And back then um, we had, of course, obviously different content departments within the, the school. And each content department had a, what we would call at the elementary level or primary level, a grade level chair or a chairperson, right? So I had this application in there for me to apply to be the chairperson. Now, remember, this is like year two, year three. And at year two, year three, I was like, I'm still just trying to figure this thing out, this thing called teaching. And uh, so I looked at the other mailboxes and I was like, oh, this must be a mistake. They put this in. This definitely is not mine. So I started looking in other mailboxes to see did other people get this too? And they didn't. So then I went and I asked who was my department chair at the time. I said, hey, look, this was in my mailbox. Do you know anything about this? I don't want to ask. You know, at that point, the school was so big. We had five assistant principals a dean of instruction and a principal. It was huge. It was like a small city. And I was like, I don't want to ask any of them because they're busy running a small city, right? So I went and asked my chairperson and she said, um, no, everybody didn't get that. Only you did. Why did you get it? Which she didn't know that I got it. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not after your position, please. Really? I'm not after your position. So come to find out the administrator that was over our department, she put it in my box. And when I talked to her, uh, I asked her, I said, well, like, why did you put this in my box? Like, I'm only like a year two, year three teacher. And she said, Mr. Wright, there's something in you about leadership and you need to go to the next level. And those of you that are fans of 80s music, I've said this in so many different speaking engagements. Um, if any of you remember this band, if you don't, you can Google them. There was this band called Flock of Seagulls. Yes. Okay? And uh, Flock of Seagulls sang this song that says, I ran. 
And that was my theme song <laughs> back then because I ran from that. I didn't want any part of leadership. I was like, please leave me alone. I politely, routinely, I politely declined. No, thank you. Let me go ahead and tell you what my plan is, ma'am. Let me tell you what my plan is, sir. I'm going to teach for 20, 25 years. State of Texas says I can get a pension after that. And then I'm, 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 you know, I'm going to kind of go do my thing and go off into some other direction. Right. Cause I was a job changer. I'd already had a career in corporate America. I was a job changer. And how many of you know that you have angels in your life and I will never forget. She is, she is a wonderful lady. Her name is Dorothy Gomez. And if she's listening to this, God bless you forever. I am totally indebted to you. And our school at the time, urban school, title one school, about 85 to 90% free and reduced lunch. It was a tough school, man. Mm. And I want to name the school out of respect for the school, but it was a tough situation. And the school had routinely missed all of the state and federal academic targets for the year. So we came to this point to where the district, there were rumors in the district about the district shutting the school down. As we would say in educator leader speak, education leadership speak, repurposing the school. Right. <laughs> okay. And um, they brought in this principal. And I remember our area superintendent, he brought her in and they uh, called us up during the summer. And they said, hey, we need everybody, a part of the staff to come to the campus. And we're like, we're on summer vacation. They're like, we know it, but every, it's an emergency meeting. Everybody's got to come the, to the campus. We go there and this lady walks up to the podium. We saw our area superintendent. We're like, wow, what is this? And this lady is about five foot one, five foot two. And the area superintendent says, I would like to introduce all of you all to your new principal. And it was Dorothy Gomez. And she was a principal that had a reputation. Now, again, remember at this point in my life, I didn't know anything about principalship and admin and leadership. I didn't want any part of that. Again, remember folks, for those that are following along in the podcast, flock of seagulls, I ran. And then the lyrics, they say, I ran so far away. <laughs> and that was, and that's what I was doing, right? I didn't know that she was brought in as a turnaround principal. And that was her rep. She was a turnaround. She made a career of being a turnaround principal. And she was phenomenal at it. She would be brought into a school that was a low performing school and two to three years, she would totally turn around the school and they would go ahead and recruit her to go turn around different schools. She's since retired, but that was her rep. And so one day, you know, I was kind of like, well, let me just stay off the radar screen. Cause I've heard that this lady is really hardcore. Like I just want to get on her bad side again. I just got this 20, 25 year plan. I'm rocking flock of seagulls. This is what we're doing. Right. And she comes up to me one day. And she says, Hey, Mr. Wright, um, what are you thinking about in your career? Uh, 20, 25 year plan. Let me go ahead and tell you about it. Get the pension from the state of Texas. She's like, okay, I don't know about that. Mr. Wright. We're going to have to talk sometime. So I get to this review and I'm sitting down with my assistant principal who does the review, their annual, what we would say down here in Texas is your summative review. And she's a kind lady. Her name is Laura Trowbridge. If you're listening, Laura Trowbridge, God bless you. She has since retired, I am sure. And so we got through doing this review. And when we got through doing this review, she said, hey, Mr. Wright, uh, here's my copy of your review. Here are your numbers. Here's your overall rating. You sign my copy. I sign your copy. And after she did that, she said, okay, what do you think about that? And I said, ma'am, you've been so gracious. Thank you so much. I'm just so proud to be on this team and I'm so happy, um, you know, to have you as an administrator. Thank you so much. And she did something, George, that I never had a, had had a leader do at that point in my life. She took the paperwork. Now, again, remember, I had signed her copy for my personnel file. She had signed my copy for my own records. So at that point, it was kind of like, okay, well, this meeting is over. May I please be adjourned? May I please be dismissed or excused, right? She took the piece of paper and she pushed it to the side. And she said, you know what, Mr. Wright, now let's go ahead and really talk. And I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> I was like, uh-oh, SpaghettiOs. Right. Something is wrong. What did I do wrong? And that's when she said, you know what, Mr. Wright, you have done everything that you can do at this school as a teacher. You need to go back to school. And I will tell you, George, that it hit me because what she didn't know, and this is how, 
you, you have to know, man, that when, hmm. when stuff lines up and stuff aligns in your life, man, it's no coincidence. It is no coincidence. She says that to me. And what she didn't know was my father and my father has, um, has passed, has been passed for some time is in, in is in heaven today. What she didn't know is my father was working on me from the other end, the other side that was outside of school. And he was saying, Hey son, you need to go back to school. No, dad. Um, let me explain to you, dad, what my 2025 20, year plan is. <laughs> He's like, no, son, you need to go to school. There's more for you. There's more for you to do. There's more people for you to help. There's more people for you to reach. And when she said that to me, I knew that it wasn't a coincidence, George. And I said to myself, as I walked out of that room, I said to myself, you know what, Vernon, I surrender. And not I surrender in a bad way. Let me tell you folks and share with you because I'm going deep. If Brene Brown is listening to this, Brene Brown, you have inspired me <laughs> All right, to be vulnerable. I surrendered to the calling and the vision on my life. And I said, you know what, Vernon, it's time to quit playing games with yourself. And it's time to go ahead and acknowledge what you're called to do. And you're called to do something bigger to reach people. This is not just about you doing your 20 or 25 year plan, retiring, getting a pension and going off into the sunset. You're called to do something bigger to help people. And uh, I surrendered to that, man. And when I say I surrendered, I want to say this. The surrendering was really the welcoming. And it was the welcoming of what has been a totally, and that's been many years ago, phenomenal experience that, that I am just so grateful and so blessed to have lived. Got into leadership, did a little bit in leadership. So blessed. That's where I met a wonderful, wonderful mentor of mine. He's done so much for me, Brian Lusk. Um, if you're listening to this, Mr. Lusk, you and I have talked many times before. I can never, ever, ever, ever repay you for everything you've done to me. Um, you're a wonderful man and somebody that I could talk to about leadership and what it meant to be a school leader, but somebody that I always knew would be real with me. You were like a brother, like an uncle and like another father to me and got a chance to do that for a while in some different places. And then got a chance to get into district level leadership. And there's another angel that I met, and I'm going to say her name, and I want her to know this. And her name is Dorothea Gordon. And Dorothea Gordon, her name is Dr. Gordon. Dr. Gordon, if you're listening to this, I want you to know you're one of my angels. And she saw something in me and said, you know what? You're destined to do big things, and I want you to do big things to help me with what I'm trying to do. And um, I was sitting in my car one day and I had just gotten on Twitter and uh, had 15 followers. Yeah, folks, I had 15. Have a screenshot to prove it. I posted the screenshot on Twitter. OK, 15 followers. I was feeling real good, George, with my 15 now. OK, double digits. I was double digits, man. <laughs> you know, it was double digits. And, um, you know, man, I. Um, I was sitting there and I was looking at some different uh, channels that were putting out videos of leaders. And I came across this channel called Disrupt Ed TV. That's what it was called back then. And I saw them, they had these different educators and leaders. And, and I saw this guy named Jay Billy. Mm -hmm. I didn't know who that was. Right. And I was like, who's this Jay Billy guy? And then I saw some, some other people that were on there and uh, I was kind of like, wow, that's so cool how they get on video and for two or three minutes, they talk about, you know, whatever it is in education. And I said to myself, you know what? I can do that. And so I had this, this, I had this moment, man. And the people that are listening to this, I just got to tell you this because I didn't plan to share this, but I'm just going to go with it anyway. For the people that are listening to this, this is going to hit somebody and it's going to hit somebody square right in front of your face and let you know you've been waiting for a confirmation. This is your confirmation. And I was sitting there and, and one half of me said, reach out to Disrupt Ed TV, send them a, a DM and ask them about you being um, on their show or on their network. And then the other half of me was like, Vernon, who in the world would want to listen to what you have to say? 
Now, again, I already gave you guys a few moments ago, the Brene Brown being vulnerable warning. I gave you that, right? <laughs> I gave you guys that. And so I was sitting there in my car, George, and again, one half of me, <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, from, from those old college fraternity movies, do it, do it, do it, right? So that was one half of me. And then the other half was like, really, Vernon, are you kidding? Who would want to listen to what you have to say? Stay in your role, stay in your place, do the 20, 25-year plan, go off into the sunset. Now, I was a, a district level support at this time, right? I was no longer in the campus leadership thing. I'd done that for a little bit, been in, in the campus leadership kind of area for a little bit. And I was at, at this point in district level leadership. Now, this is what I want to say. I had the, the, the old paradigm working in my mind. It was just working at a different level. Let me say that again, folks. I had the old paradigm working in my mind. It was just working at a different level. So instead of being the 20 or 25 year plan as a teacher, it was 2025 year plan uh, at district level support. And I'm just going to be honest with you and tell you this. You know what I had let myself do? I had let myself be on cruise control. If any of you have driven long hours on the interstates, you know how you put the car on cruise control at 70 or whatever the speed limit is, and you just kick back. And I put myself on cruise control. And so the part of me that was like, do it, do it, right? I said, okay, you know what? And so I made a deal with myself. Some of you may have made deals with yourself, right? I'm going to go deep when I say this. I made a deal with myself and the deal was this. You know what, Vernon? Just send the message to Disrupt Ed TV. And then once you send the message, I, your other half, I will quit bugging you about it. And you would be able to walk away and say, you know what? At least I did it and I'm done with it. And then I can put it on the shelf. That was the deal I made with myself, right? And those of you that are listening, you had these real moments where you make this deal with yourself. So I reached out to, at the time, the gentleman that was running Disrupted TV, his name is Rich Allen, another angel in my life. And he was uh, also had another gentleman that was working with him. But Rich Allen was the guy that I reached out to, uh, administrator, longtime former administrator in New Jersey, wonderful man. And when I reached out to him, George, you know, um, I didn't expect for him to re respond. I didn't expect for him to respond at all. Hmm. He responded quickly. And I was like, oh, my goodness, like, what do I do now? Right. Because the bet that I had made with myself was doubting myself. Right. Because the bet was you just send the DM and you're cool. Then you can back off of it. Right. And <laughs> so then I was like, oh, he responded back. What do I do now? <laughs> right. right. And and. Uh, so we start talking. He says, hey, call me on the phone. Here's my phone number. Let's talk. We start talking. He says, hey, yeah, thanks for watching the shows, whatever. And I said, yeah, I think I can do one of your shows. And then I kind of looked at myself and I was like, did I just say that? Did I just say that? And he was like, really? So talk to me about conceptually. Talk to me about your background, so forth, so on. So we had a little talk, right? And this is what he said at the end of the call. He said, I tell you what. He said, now, remember, folks, I had never done a podcast. I had never done anything. All I had done at that point over the years was professional learning um, at the campus level and at the district level. And then I had done some speaking at the local level and regional level, maybe even a little bit at the state level, but it wasn't anything beyond that, right? That's kind of the space that, that I had been in in terms of professional experience. So he says, I tell you what, Vernon, um, do a demo for me, do a prototype. I'm gonna give you seven days to do it. At the, before the seven days is over, send it to me. I'll watch it and let's talk. And the hustler part of me, the ambitious part of me, the visionary part of me said, you know what? Bet. As they say on the streets, bet. I said, you got a deal. And he said, all right, you got seven days. Let's see what you come up with. Yes, sir. I hang, hung up the phone. And I had it really kind of what was like a Dave Burgess moment when Dave tells this story where he agreed to do the workshop. And then, and then he was like, I've never done a workshop. I got off the phone, George, and I was like, I've never taped myself. I don't have studio lights. I don't have a camera. Like what, like, what did I just agree to? 
these people have professional studio equipment. They have. And I was like, oh, my goodness, what did I just agree to? And then I said, but you know what, Vernon, you're deep in it. Let's go. Let's just go with it anyway. Right. Then I made another deal with myself. Do the video. If it's terrible, it's a ter- it's terrible. At least you'll say you can say that you did the video. At least you can say, hey, I, I held up my end of the bargain and I'm good. Right. So I do the video, which was was absolutely horrible. Guys, I, I have I, I've kidded with several people and I, I've, I've said to them, I almost want to tell YouTube to take it down because it's cringy. As my daughter would say, it's cringy, dad. (laughs) Right. And uh, shout out to my daughter. She's listening. She is wonderful. (laughs) Love you so much. And uh, she tells it all the time. She's like, dad, that's kind of cringy. I'm like, no, it's really stunning. But anyway, that video was cringy. It's still up on YouTube. Please don't go look at it. And um, Rich looked at it and he said, you know what, man? He said, yeah, you know, production value wise or whatever, maybe it could be a little bit better. He said, but you know what? Your messaging is on point, man. I like it. Let's do a show together. And that's how it started, George. And I was like, what? Like, you really? And he was like, man, your message and what you're talking about, we need that. And so I started uh, over the course of several different months uh, doing this show on Disrupt Ed. And I uh, had, of course, Dave on the show, had you on the show. And I want to tell, tell people a funny story. I was sitting in the parking lot of my gym. I was getting ready to go into the gym and work out. And I had been looking at Georgia stuff on social media like, like half of the free world does. And, uh, and so I was like, man, this George Kuros guy, like this guy, like this guy's legit, man. Like this dude. This dude is like for this dude has got like more followers than a major metropolitan city. Like this dude is like this dude is legit, man. And like this dude is like, you know, and that's back when you had the real long hair. I was like, this dude got the long hair and he got the beard game. Y'all see, I'm I'm all about that beard game. And uh, (laughs) and I said, like, like I could be having a man crush on this dude, man. Right. And I said, let me reach out to this dude and say if he'll be on my show. Right. Send him a DM. And I was like, I'm going to send this guy a DM. I'm going to go in and work out. And I made another deal with myself. Now y'all get that strategy. I'm making a deal with myself to get myself to take the next step. So I said, you know what? I'm going to DM this guy. So I won't have to worry about it. And I won't be bugging myself about it. And I'll be able to say, I DM'd him. If he never responds, I'll be able to tell people, Hey, he never responded. That's not on me. That's on him. You responded back very, very shortly. And I was like, part two folks. Uh Oh, what do I do now? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. And uh, and it was kind of like one of those things like you and Dave have said so many times, Dave Burgess. Say yes and figure it out. Mm. And uh, and let me say that again. Say yes and figure it out, because when your heart and your spirit are in it and you're truly committed to doing whatever it is. And again, remember, it's not just committed. It's beast mode committed. There are people that are interested. There are people that are committed they're people that are beast mode committed. And once you become beast mode committed, I'm telling you folks, the right people, the right place, the right time, the right ideas, the right solutions, it all comes together. And I uh, was very fortunate, fast forward, to have you on the show. And um, did that for a while. And then I got a phone call one day. And the phone call was from another angel in my life. And his name is Glenn Robbins. Glenn Robbins, a superintendent up in New Jersey, a wonderful man. God bless you, sir. And he uh, called me up one day and he said, hey, I've been talking to some people and they told me that um, you're a person that I need to go ahead and invite to be a speaker at my conference, to be one of my speakers. What's the conference? He said, it's this rewire conference. Okay, where's that at? Now, again, remember, folks, I was just a Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex, Dallas Fort Worth region. I had spoken at the time a little bit in Austin, Texas, which was our state capital. Um but I hadn't done anything beyond that. Okay. And he said, well, the conference is in New Jersey. It's in where (laughs) he said, yeah, it's in New Jersey. And I was like, okay, I've never ever been to New Jersey. And I've been to a lot of States in the United States, but I'd never been to New Jersey. And he said, Hey, here's the date, whatever, whatever. He said, send me, um, send me what your, what your topics are that you want to talk about. Talk to me about what your signature topics are. And I will tell you, those that are in George and I were talking about this earlier um, off mic, those of you that are speakers 
or that are that are aspiring speakers have at least one speech ready to go. Have at least one slide deck ready to go. Have at least one signature thing that you're ready to talk about. And when I coach people, I do a lot of um, executive and personal one-on-one coaching as a life coach. And one of the things that I ask my clients that are aspiring speakers is this, if you got a phone call from a conference organizer that said, hey, we had a, uh, our main keynote speaker drop out. We had another speaker drop out last minute family emergency. Um, we got to have somebody here. There are too many people that are going to be here for us to say there's no speaker. If we sent you a plane ticket, we got you an email of a plane ticket now from American Airlines. Could you jump on a jet and be here in 48 hours and on our stage? Would you be ready? And they're like, uh, I don't know. And so we have to be ready to have that. And so I was like, you know what? Thankfully enough, I've got some signature stuff. I've got some stuff that I've spoken about. Let's do it. And that's what I meant when I got to that conference. I'd never been to New Jersey, by the way. And you know what, folks? New Jersey to uh, Dallas to New Jersey, roughly, I know it's a little bit more, roughly about 1,500 miles. So I traveled 1,500 miles by myself not really knowing a whole bunch of people that were there, not really having met anyone that was there. Um, I went on faith because I knew that, you know what, like, this is my calling. If some people say, this is my jam, this is what I do. This is what I'm built to do. And that's when I met Beth Huff, one half of lead like a pirate, one half of the co-authorship of lead like a pirate with Shelley Burgess. That's when I met in person. Finally, the guy that I'd seen so much, Jay Billy, Wonderful man. Jay Billy's my man. We both share the same haircut. Jay Billy, if you're listening to this, shout out to you, my brother. Love talking to you, my man. Um, And I met so many other people. That's when I met the phenomenal David Kolberhouse. Wow, what a brain that guy is. Hmm. And um, to sit and talk to those people, George, was just, it was one of the breakout moments and watershed moments of my career. And I want to say this to people. You see, and I'm going to say uh, there was a Hall of Famer. I won't name the Hall of Famer, but I will say he's from the Dallas Cowboys. Go Cowboys. Cowboys Nation. Uh, They do need to do better, though. I admit that. (laughs) But there was a Hall of Famer who said um, when he was uh, accepting his Hall of Fame jacket during his Hall of Fame speech, he said, people see the public successes, but they don't see the private struggles, the private challenges. And I know a lot of people see Vernon Wright at Sign the Right Leader, again, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and Clubhouse at Sign the Right Leader, unified branding-wise across all social media channels, Uh, (laughs) Discord as well, and uh, Twitch if you're a gamer. And let me throw this one in there too, Xbox Live. If you get any Xbox Live folks, at Sign the Right Leader as well. Oh, it's a little, bl- okay. little, little, yeah, little branding, little branding tip there for y'all. If y'all are into gaming or into branding, I should say, make sure if you can get the social media handles to be the same across all of them. But um, one move, one move of faith and look at all the doors that it opened. And uh, one of the things I've shared many times in speaking engagements is my life has been a lot like this game show. Uh, and I know I'm a little bit more seasoned. As someone told me one time, they said, you don't say old, you just say classic. I guess I should say I'm classic. (laughs) And uh, is uh, I shared one time with someone and I've shared with many during speaking engagements. My life has been a lot like the TV show. Let's make a deal. I know many of you may not may not even know what that show is. Google it. Put it on YouTube. You'll see videos of it. And in this game show, there are all of these cool prizes behind doors, but you didn't know what the prizes were. You just had to pick the door. And once they, when they opened up the door or whatever, you, it revealed what all the prizes were. And my life, George, in many ways has been like, let's make a deal because there were so many cool things in my life. This being on this podcast with you, connecting with you was in my future. ZeroApologyZone.com, my apparel, online apparel website. When you go to that website, whatever you buy, buy 30 of them. I'm just joking. <laughs> but... Um, all of the different speaking engagements, all the different things that I've been able to do, all the different client school districts that I've worked with, all the clients that I've coached one-on-one personally in my personal coaching business, all the things that I've been able to do investments-wise and and trading, being a foreign currency trader. And all of that was waiting for me, George. All of that was waiting for me 
back when I was running from it. And I want to say this, you know, it's funny for me to say, um, you know, Flock of Seagulls and I ran and I might even listen to that song after this episode (laughs) and uh, because a little throwback in time there. But the very thing I was running from was the very thing I needed to run to. And let me say that one one more time. The very thing I was running from was the very thing I needed to run to. And once I had a real conversation with myself and I said, you know what, Vernon, let's not play around. The 20 year, 20, 25 year plan and being on cruise control, that's not what you're on this earth to do. And uh, people talk about having crucial conversations. What I say is always this, when I coach my clients, you need to have a crucial conversation with yourself. Because before you can go to the next level, you're going to have to do introspection. And anybody that tells you that they made a next level move and they didn't do introspection, turn around and politely tell them, excuse me, and run as fast as you can. (laughs) Right? Because it requires introspection. Well, you're, Vernon, when you're talking though, and and this is really like just sitting and talking to you for the last little while, you, you mention a ton of mentors. Uh, like you, you use the word mentor, like you have the most <laughs> mentors of anyone I've ever met. Right? And right. it's interesting that when you share this, um, you can, when you're kind of, kind of walking through your story, you can see there's this total belief that other people have in you that you don't yet have at certain points in your career. Mm-hmm. And then you eventually, you can see how that develops. Right. And it's, I think this is a really important lesson, not just uh, for administrators, but teachers is that a lot of times people just need one person to believe in them. Right. Preach that man. To, to give that, to give that feeling. Right. And one of the reasons that, I really wanted to talk to you today and kind of seeing and and hearing your journey and hearing your story and how you get to that point. It's, it's almost like, I I feel guilty for bringing this up is in the sense that like I've watched you just accelerate your career in 2020 in 2021. And in a time I like the reason I feel guilty is it's almost like I, I, sometimes I feel Like, I feel bad that I, and obviously it's for different reasons, but you know, I had, we had our daughter, Georgia, and I look at 2020 as a blessed year, obviously because of that. And a lot of things happen where I couldn't travel and now I'm home with my daughters and I I appreciate that. And it's almost, sometimes I feel bad for like saying like, you know, like I, and it's not to acknowledge that things aren't bad in other places that people aren't having struggles Um, but it's just trying to take that time to appreciate what's really good, but kind of watching your career in the last little while, what have you done to create success for yourself in such a, you know, crazy year, right. And in that time, and like, you can hear it in your stories, the mentality that has been, you've been kind of you know, mentored and developed in yourself, but like, what, what has it been that has helped you excel in a really hard time? So I'm going to take you guys back to one of my non-education mentors. And I, and I'm not saying that uh, you shouldn't have mentors in education. Uh, I have several of them, right. But um, I would be remiss if I did not tell you that as many mentors as I have that are in education, I probably have more mentors that are not, that are in the world of business. Because again, remember my bachelor's degree is in economics and finance. So all of them, all, always a part of me will be business. And he said, you know, Vernon, you need to tighten up your morning routine. And I was like, yeah, okay. And so he asked me, well, what things are you doing in your morning routine? We started talking about it some more, which he had some knowledge of, but we went deeper, right? And then he started telling me there's certain things that you need to do. There's certain things that you need to do. And he started enumerating what those things were. I won't drop all of those things here because I reserve those things for my clients that I coach one-on-one, but I will drop some pro tips. So if you're taking notes, this is a great place to take notes right now, folks. (laughs) Okay. A great way to take notes. 
and I mentioned this on some other podcasts as well. Number one, you need a vision board. You need a vision board, folks. Um, people called me about three or four years ago when I started talking about vision boards and I started like, and I bought my first vision board. I told some friends and some other people professionally and personally, and they really kind of laughed at me. Oh yeah, vision board, da, 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 da. But I have to tell you something, folks. <laughs> oh, I laugh, not at the people, but I laugh at, at the lessons that you derive from life as being so powerful. The moment I went up to that vision board and I had to take something off of my vision board because it had already manifested in my life. Folks, <laughs> let me tell you, folks, it's so powerful. So you need a vision board. The second thing you need to do, you need to get up. And George and I have been talking about this offline. You need to get up every morning and you need to journal. Now, I am not an old school uh, paper and pen, paper and pencil kind of journal person. So that does not excite me at all. <laughs> OK, I'm a typer. Right. I, I like to uh, I fancy myself as being someone who can type. Oh, I say roughly around 60 to 70 words per minute with not that many errors. <laughs> um, but I was a typer. I am a typer. Right. So here's here's a pro tip for y'all especially those of you all that are fans of Apple devices. The app is called Day One, D-A-Y-O-N-E. And it is a journaling app. And I use that journaling app myself. I've used it for a long time. I have it on my MacBook Pro, from which I'm talking to you right now. It syncs across my iPad Pro, syncs across my iPhone as well. So no matter where I'm at, no matter what I'm doing, Day One app, is on all of my devices or whatever device is on me at the time. Two really cool things about that app that I really like. If you would say, you know, Vernon, I'm not really experienced in journaling. I'm kind of new to this thing. Uh, what do I write about, right? I just want to get into the practice of writing. One of the things that's neat about day one is it will give you a daily prompt. Like I had a daily prompt one time. What's your favorite music and what about that music moves you? That's, that's awesome. I love that. Yeah. So if you're that kind of person where you've never written before, just use the prompt, the daily prompt that day one gives you. When I got past the daily prompt, I started getting into uh, some deeper things. I started journaling about things that were going on in my professional life, things that were going on in my personal life. This really became my online diary. Hmm. But here's the other thing that I did. And I journal and I do that every single day. The other thing that I do, and again, I'm not going to reveal all of them, uh, but I'm definitely going to drop some pro tips here. One of the other things that I do every single morning, folks, some of you may laugh, but I'm going to say to you this, it's been working over and over and over in my life. I have a list of affirmations and I read those affirmations aloud to myself every morning, every single morning. You may say, well, Vernon, what does that mean? Uh, what, what, what would an example of an affirmation mean? I have an affirmation that says, I am a person that does da 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 And I specifically talk about whatever the action is, who the action benefits, and how it benefits that person. That's a specific thing. And I, that's just one affirmation, Right. And I read that list of affirmations every single morning. Now, some of you that follow me deeply, you know that, that uh, on my IG profile and on my Twitter profile and on Clubhouse and some other spaces, I have the initials NLP, which stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming. So I'm a certified Neuro Linguistic Programming coach. NLP is, is called shorthand. And that just kind of works on how we get the mind to process and work very efficiently. And one of the things that we talk a lot about in NLP is the power of you hearing yourself say something. Now, I know that's deep. I don't mean to get esoteric. I don't pretend to be this person that understands everything on this metaphysical deep level, right? But when you hear yourself, when your inner ear and your outer ear, when they come together and they hear you saying that about yourself, something powerful works, folks. Now, you may ask me, Vernon, why does that work? I don't know. But you know what a mentor said to me one time, George? He asked me, he said, uh, are you an electrical engineer? I said, no, sir, I'm not. 
<laughs> I said, you know that. You know I'm not an electrical engineer. Why are you asking me this crazy question, right? And he said, well, which typically when he would ask me questions like this, um, I know that, you know, hey, he's going somewhere with this, right? So I, I just play along with the game. And he said, well, uh, you're not an electrical engineer. You don't know everything about electricity. But when you flip that light switch on, you're using electricity. And I said, well, sir, I, it's just flipping a light switch. And he said, exactly, Vernon. He said, here's what trips up people. People want to try to understand every little nuance about why something works when that moment in the present, all they need to know is that it works and they need to take massive action. And I was like, wow. And he said, so what your goal is in life is to find out what are the things that are your highest leverage things that you can do to help elevate people and to help be a blessing to people. And I'm reminded of this book that I read many, many moons ago. It's, there's a 2.0 version of it that has been out for a while, but uh, Leverage Leadership by the great Dr. Paul Bambrick Santoyo, one of my favorites. Those of you that are looking for either the 1.0 or the 2.0 version, there's a picture of a hammer on the front. Got an opportunity many moons ago to hear him speak as a young aspiring administrator about how he turned around schools, routinely turned around schools, school after school after school that was kind of like some of the schools that I worked in that were in danger of being closed and repurposed. But I found out what those highest leverage, those highest leverage items and things were. And then I just committed myself to taking action, massive action. And, that, and that, I'm, it's funny you say that because one of the, we talked about, you know, some of the weight loss I've gone through. And one of the things that's really helped me is I have a board in my basement, so the, just a whiteboard. And I, and I wrote my goal where I want to be. And I wrote where I started. And I, every week, Monday, which is the day we're actually recording today, I write like, what, what did I actually do this week? Like, did I, uh, what's my goal? And I've seen it go off, you know, and that drives me. Right. Uh, but also on that board I put, and I know this is not your typical vision board, but there's a connection to what you're talking about. I put the exercise I'm going to do. Right. So I do not leave until that's done. And there is a power every time I check it when I just, yes, sir. It, right. And I think that to me, you know, I love your advice about journaling and connecting and honestly um it, it's amazing all the stories that you have all the mentorship you have behind you it says believe study hustle manifest repeat and uh you don't just write that behind you you right? you live that and i i love just i love listening to your story i love hearing some of the strategies that you have where can people find you uh, what is clubhouse by the way i don't even know what clubhouse yes is. Clubhouse, ladies and gentlemen, Clubhouse is the newest, I shouldn't say the newest, one of the newest social media platforms. And uh, I would basically say this, this is what someone said the other day as a way to describe it. It's like Voxer live and real time. I'm out. I'm out. I hate Voxer. <laughs> so so wow. those of you that are fans of Voxer where you know you put in the message and you wait to hear what someone else says back as a response. This is like, it's like Voxer in real time, or like someone else said uh, last week, it's like Zoom without any cameras. You know, I, and, hated, I hated Voxer so much that because I, <laughs> I hate voicemail that it actually got me to take my voicemail off my phone. <laughs> like, I don't want to hear anyone <laughs> voicemail ever again. Yeah. I'm not saying anyone who's listening, if you like Voxer, that's all good. There's certain right. things I like that you probably hate, but I hate voicemail so much, so... Yes. So it's so Clubhouse is so Clubhouse is like this space where people come together and they just have these really deep conversations about whatever the topics are. So those that find me out on Clubhouse. But anyway, here's where I am. Right. Because you asked that. I want to go ahead and share that with the people. Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, Clubhouse, Discord, Twitch and Xbox Live. I think that's and all of them. And all at the right leader, right? All at sign the T H E right W R I G H T leader L E A D E R. And if you come <laughs> to me on Xbox Live, I'm gonna tell you right now, like one of my gaming mentors says, you don't want this smoke because I'm ready for you folks. 
<laughs> you play on Xbox Live. On Xbox Live, I play all kinds of stuff. So, you know, COD, got Madden, got 2K. Hey, also to uh, have, right? Uh, also have 2K Golf. So if any of you want to go ahead and do some 2K Golf, I got some of that for you as well. I might have to get an Xbox just to play. You have to get just, uh, I got moves, man. <laughs> I got moves in different areas, man. I got moves. So, but yeah, it's, you know, one of the things I want to say is about this, and it's one of the reasons why I love every time I get a chance to talk to you, man, is we have to be, and, and we talked about this earlier off mic, who you associate yourself with, man, and who you're with and community with, man, it's everything. And it, it's, it just matters so much. Holy. And I got to tell you this, man, for people that are wanting to make 2021 moves, this is what I tell leaders all the time when I coach them personally and even clients that are not in leadership, I tell them to check their circle. Can I drop a quick pro tip out there for them? Do it. Quick pro tip. I want you to pick up your phone right now and I want you to go to contacts on your phone, Apple or Android, doesn't matter. And I want you to scroll through. I want you to do two things with this. And you guys have never heard this from anyone in the educational space, but I'm going to drop this pro tip on you that normally I reserve for clients. I want you to go through your contacts. And the first thing I want you to do is I want you to start looking at people in your contacts that are people that are really not good for you to be around. And in some cases, I'm going to use the word, some people that you know are toxic people in your life. Mm -hmm. And I want you to really come to that decision point about whether you need to keep that contact or not. And some of you need to delete some contacts. I do that at least once a year. The second thing I want you to do is I want you to go through your contacts and I want you to pick two or three people that you haven't talked to in a while, but still have a special place in your life. And I want you to send them this text. Hey, haven't talked to you in a while. I just want to let you know how thankful I am for you being in my life. That's it. Hit send. Watch and see what happens. Watch and see what happens, people. Watch and see what happens. Love it. And oh, whoo, I'm so pumped up, man. I want to go do that myself. <laughs> I love it. Uh, hey, Bird, and thanks for having me. And behind you, uh, I know that you talk about all the mentors that you have, but I know that you've mentored so many people uh, explicitly that you know you've mentored and people that see the energy uh, the positivity that you bring every day to so many different spaces, including Xbox Live and Clubhouse, which is the only place I'm not going to connect with you. <laughs> Everywhere else I'm going, <laughs> it's like Voxer. So anyways, hey, thanks for listening, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful day, Vernon. Thanks so much. Thank you. What a pleasure.